Hi, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to our special uh, event uh, with uh, David Page and his uh, wonderful book, uh, Food Americana. So we'll be, we'll be hearing from him in a minute, but first I want to thank you and welcome you all to this special event uh, with, uh, in conjunction with the POSNAC JCC and also the ALPR JCC. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce myself. My name is Danny Reed. I'm the new Cultural Arts and Adult Programs Director for the Miami Beach JCC. And I'm happy to represent them uh, tonight as well. So um, I don't know if you can tell, but I love food or food loves me uh, too much. And uh, one of my favorite programs to watch over the last few years has been Diners, Drive-Ins and Dives. So I was very excited that uh, we would all have an opportunity to bring, uh, to present to us David Page, who was the creator and, uh, and founder of this, um, of this TV program. But, but in addition to that, you know, I was looking over David's, um, David's bio, and uh, in addition to, to creating that and other food-oriented uh, uh, um, programs, his background is as a, a news journalist. And, you know, he, one of the things that I found very interesting about him, uh, in addition to being award-winning news journalist, as well as the creator of Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives, is uh, that he was one of the first people to walk across Checkpoint Charlie when the Berlin Wall fell, among other things. And he was apparently served couscous by the chefs of uh, Muammar Gaddafi. Um, but we're here to talk about food, and we're here to talk about American food, and uh, especially his book, Food Americana, which offers, offers us an amazing broad view of where some of our favorite foods come from. And with that, David, I will uh, turn it over to you. Okay. Thank, thank you thank very you much, Danny. Here. And thanks to everybody for the opportunity to visit and chat with you all about some of my favorite things, food, travel, writing, television, and of course, myself. Late on a Thursday afternoon back in 2006, I was on the phone with an executive from the Food Network pitching show ideas. After decades as a hard news journalist, including long stints at ABC and NBC covering some of the world's biggest stories, I'd opened up a production company and was trying to sell shows, but nobody was buying what I was selling. I'd pitched this executive many times before, and she had rejected every idea I had until this moment when she asked me, have you got anything about diners? I said, absolutely. I'm developing a show called Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. I told her all about it. To my surprise, she said, that sounds good. We have a development meeting on Tuesday. Get me a write-up for a one-hour special by Monday. Well, that was great news, except for one problem. I was not developing a program called Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. I had just pulled the name and the show concept out of thin air. Well, I spent the weekend calling all around the country to talk with food writers, historians, restaurant owners, anyone who could help me find a half dozen restaurants to include in my proposal. I submitted it on Monday. The network folks had their meeting on Tuesday, and soon they gave me a green light for a one-hour program. My first question was, do you want to talk about potential hosts? They said, no, we know who we want you to use, Guy Fieri. They told me he just won their next Food Network star competition. Now, I didn't know who Guy Fieri was, or even that there was something called the next Food Network star, because frankly, I didn't watch food TV. So I Googled Guy's name and what came up was some kind of cartoon, a spiky haired bleach blonde man child in shorts and flip flops. My immediate reaction was of course, I'm screwed. And things didn't get much better when I talked with Guy on the phone. As a lifelong Californian, he didn't even know what a diner really was. He'd never been to one. They had coffee shops out where he was. But he would prove to be a quick study and incredible on camera. Our first shoot was at the Bayway Diner. They say location is everything. Well, this was across from a petroleum refinery in Linden, New Jersey. 
It was a small place, traditional chrome diner architecture, eight or 10 seats at the counter, owned by a local firefighter and frequented by a very local crowd. Now, Guy didn't know diners, but he knew how to work a restaurant. He jumped behind the counter and started helping out, flipping hash browns, serving coffee, and most important, bantering and joking with the customers. To my astonishment, it was absolute TV magic. And again, this wasn't his natural environment. For example, he kept making mafia jokes, cracking that if he messed up an order, they'd find his body later. I called for a brief break in shooting, walked him outside and explained, hey, dude, you're in New Jersey. This is not a topic to joke about here. I pointed out that at least one guy at the counter was clearly packing a gun. Now, as I said, guy was a quick study. There were no more mob jokes. We went on to shoot the rest of the special over the next 16 days. We visited half a dozen restaurants, met lots of amazing people, and unbelievably, Guy just got better and better. The show ran on the Food Network in the first week of November 2006, and it rated so well that what was supposed to be a one-time special got picked up as a series that is still in production today. I produced the first 11 seasons. They're now in season 30-something. Diners afforded me a deep insider's look at the heart and soul of food in America, of the remarkable people, the moms and pops working insane hours, seven days a week, often teetering on the edge of bankruptcy, to create real homemade food they care about, people motivated by pleasing others, like the couple serving mutton barbecue in Lexington, Kentucky, who later told me they were about to declare bankruptcy until being on diners brought in new customers. The third generation owner of a Mexican restaurant in San Diego, who's still making tortillas from scratch just as her grandfather did 80 years ago. The Indiana couple who used to go to the local hamburger joint when they were dating, now they own the place. Their specialty is a peanut butter burger. The Texas woman who became a local legend serving goat burgers from a three-sided shack by a dusty road. Customers waiting in long lines then sharing communal picnic tables. Food after all is the great social lubricant. Meals are where we come together to share, to talk, to experience each other. Actually, it's something I first began to take notice of before I created diners when I was assigned to work internationally for NBC News. For six years or so, I covered Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. First living in London, then Frankfurt, then Budapest, where I opened a bureau to cover the coming fall of communism. Now, I had never expected to get an overseas assignment. All of a sudden, I was going from country I knew nothing about to country I knew nothing about. And as I tried to fill in the major gaps in my knowledge while on the run, I came to realize that food is the gateway to understanding a culture. It's people, it's history, geography, climate, economics, mindset, what matters to people, how they live their lives. In Paris, the importance of taking time to have a leisurely meal, not grabbing a sandwich on the run, reflects the French attitude toward work-life balance. In Strasbourg in Eastern France, the signature dish is choucroute, an obviously Germanic plate of sauerkraut topped with sausage or hunks of pork, not kosher, but delicious. It reflects the political turmoil of the region where control has shifted back and forth between Germany and France for decades. In 2001, British Foreign Secretary Robin Cook called chicken tikka masala, quote, a true British national dish, and curry is among the country's most popular foods. All of that is a reminder of the United Kingdom's colonial past, as is IPA, created because adding hops 
helped preserve beer on its long voyage to the British bureaucrats stationed in India. The so-called national dish of Tuscany is pappardella cinghiale, egg pasta with a wild boar ragu. Many other Tuscan dishes rely on boar as well, which reflects the region's long tradition of hunting, which itself reflects a long history of poverty, of having to live off the land. In Greece, the meza, the table full of small plates shared by everyone, reflects a culture that prizes community. Ancient Greek philosopher Epicurus, and yes, the word did come from his name, Epicurus said, quote, we should look for someone to eat and drink with before looking for something to eat and drink, for dining alone is leading the life of a lion or wolf. When my 28-year-old daughter was eight or nine, she asked me why every time I talked about a place I had visited, I talked about the food there. Well, because my experiences with food are some of the most memorable of my many years abroad. And in fact, sitting at a table, eating their foods with people of other countries, discussing them, and so much more with my table mates provided me with a remarkable education and a seemingly endless trove of incredible memories. The duck in a speckled pot like my grandmother used to cook in at a small restaurant by the airport in Gdansk, Poland, after interviewing Lech Wałęsa, the dissident who would eventually become Poland's president and win the Nobel Peace Prize. The vice versa from a stand under the elevated train in East Berlin under communist rule, a bright spot in a grim and gray place. I remember gorging on caprese, the freshest tomatoes topped with handmade mozzarella, shiny basil and glistening olive oil in Rome after a long, exhausting, and vegetable-free stretch in Baghdad just before the, before the first Iraq war. In Istanbul, it was the live eel presented to us tableside for inspection before being killed, cooked, and served. In Israel, the world's greatest falafel, at a little stand in Herzliya. In Florence, fungi porcini, massive mushrooms as big as a dinner plate, cooked and served like a steak. And one of my favorite memories in a dive bar in Moscow, after a few shots of vodka, or maybe more than a few, and despite a major language barrier, talking with another patron, an indigenous Siberian, visiting the big bad city for the first time. Fearful of what he would find there, he brought his own provisions, as he showed me when he opened his flimsy, plastic, Soviet-made briefcase to reveal that it was filled with salted, dried fish. He offered me some, which I found to be a sweet gesture of friendship and extremely salty. Having created so many food sense memories in so many different countries and having created a hit TV show out of restaurants serving what we Americans love, I found myself asking the question, does America have a national cuisine? And if so, what is it? I spent two years chasing the answers for food Americana. My conclusions, yes, there is a uniquely American cuisine. We created it by taking bits and pieces of the cuisines of other countries and cultures, modifying them all to our tastes, and to the availability of ingredients here and evolving them over time. For example, the bagel. Now the first written mention of the bagel is from 1610 when the Jewish council of Krakow, Poland published a set of regulations for various aspects of daily Jewish life. For some reason, they declared bagels appropriate to be served after a child was born. And by the 19th century, Jewish bakers were selling bagels to both Jews and non-Jews, 
especially on market day. Young boys would walk around the market shouting, bagels, lemonade, corn on the cob. In the late 1800s, when Jews from Eastern Europe began streaming into America to escape poverty and anti-Semitism, the bagel came with them, a little piece of home in a terrifying new world. By 1900, there were 70 bagel bakeries on the Lower East Side of New York and a handful in a few other cities with enough Jews to support them. But the number of bagels any one bakery could make was limited by just how labor intensive the process was. The dough had to be mixed by hand. Then each bagel had to be properly shaped, thrown into boiling water, taken out, put in the oven, then just at the right moment, taken out to cool. It was tough work. It was tough work. Until a guy named Daniel Thompson came along, a junior high shop teacher and inveterate tinkerer. He actually invented the fold-up roll-away ping pong table, but he would make a much larger impact on America with his next invention. He worked on it for years. And finally, in 1962, he patented the Thompson Automatic Bagel Making Machine, which vastly increased production and speed, making it possible to turn out as many as 4,800 bagels an hour. Then for two years, he unsuccessfully tried to find a bakery willing to use it until he finally found the Lender brothers, Murray, Marvin, and Sam Lender, who ran one of the first bagel bakeries outside of New York City in New Haven, Connecticut. They had taken it over from their father, were looking to expand, and most importantly, they had vision. The lenders leased Thompson's first machine and made it with another major technological advance, freezing. Frozen foods were just coming into vogue, and the lenders began freezing their bagels and shipping them to places people had never seen one. I spoke with Marvin Lender, the last surviving brother. He's in his 80s now, a great guy and a major philanthropist. He told me, this is a quote, to take a Jewish product and introduce it to the non-Jewish world, we were advertising when we didn't have a penny. We borrowed money to do it, but it was the only way we could introduce the product to a segment of the population that didn't even know what a bagel was. And to further interest that population, lenders added flavors never before seen on the Lower East Side, such as raisin and honey. But even as America embraced lenders' bagels, those who'd grown up on the New York original complained bitterly that they were a pale imitation of the real thing, not chewy enough or crunchy enough, not bagel-y enough. Marvin Lender says, of course they weren't, but mass producing anything changes it. And anyway, they had to appeal to Midwestern tastes. Purists blame Thompson's automatic bagel machine for the softening of the bagel, saying it only worked with a watered down dough. Thompson's sons, who now run the company, indignantly say, not true. Their father's machine could handle any dough. It was the other company's equipment that mixed and cut the dough to feed into the machine that could not. And neither could the copycat automatic bagel makers soon produced by new competitors. Still, automation quickly adopted not just by lenders, but a raft of other food companies as well, unquestionably produced a softer bagel. And that's now the standard almost everywhere as is a sweeter taste and a raft of stabilizers and preservatives. The bagel revolution the lenders created is all around us today, from independent bagel shops to bagel chains, to fast food joints, to massive grocery store suppliers like Thomas's English Muffins and a huge multinational Bimbo Bakeries, that really is their name, headquartered in Luxembourg. In fact, they now own lenders. Murray Lender calls it all the bagelization of America. In this case, the rest of the country embraced what had been only Jewish. But there is a flip side to that story. 
the saga of Jews and Chinese food. It's a stereotype summed up in that old joke. A Jewish guy and a Chinese guy are talking. The Chinese guy says proudly, our culture is more than 4,000 years old. The Jewish guy says, hmm, our culture is more than 5,000 years old. The Chinese guy asks, so where did you eat for 1,000 years? But stereotype aside, Jewish immigrants really did embrace Chinese food. The Chinese, themselves victimized by violent racial hate, didn't share the anti-Semitism and racism that was widespread in the country. Hence, Chinese restaurants offered a refuge for Jews and African-Americans who would often not be welcomed elsewhere. At the same time, and paradoxically, for the families of Jewish immigrants, eating Chinese food was seen as a big step toward fitting in. Sociologist Gay Tuckman, co-author of a seminal academic study on Jews and Chinese food, says it made them feel American. And food that wasn't kosher, pork, shellfish, somehow seemed easier to justify when it was diced into little pieces and hidden among vegetables and sauce, a kind of safe trafe. I saw it myself. My grandfather kept kosher, which somehow didn't stop him from eating frequently in New York's Chinatown and often taking me with him. He loved Chinatown, claiming that when he had been an assistant attorney general of New York State, he had stopped the Tong Wars, violence between rival gangs in Chinatown by calling a summit meeting and threatening to deport everybody, whatever his actual involvement was. And I never researched it because I so want the story to be true. My grandfather was warmly welcomed in the basement restaurants that lined Mott Street, where his favorite dish was shrimps and lobster sauce. He insisted it was actually chicken. What it was was part of a menu created specifically to please the American palate, a process that had begun shortly after the first Chinese immigrants came to America for the great California gold rush of the mid 1800s. Some hoping to find gold themselves, others setting up stores and restaurants to keep the Chinese miners supplied and fed. As non-Chinese began sampling the food, the restaurateurs figured out what Americans would eat and, more importantly, what they would not, which led initially to a highly controversial dish called chop suey, a combination of stir-fried vegetables and some kind of protein, all covered in a thick brown sauce. Some culinary historians claim chop suey was a fraud, a dish passed off to unsuspecting Americans as Chinese, even though it was invented here out of whole cloth, just exotic enough to seem exciting, but with texture and gravy reminiscent of American stews. Others insist it's a modification of a dish made in China where it featured entrails and offal among the vegetables instead of the beef, pork, or chicken in the Americanized version. What is certain is that chop suey ignited America's love affair with Chinese food. It was chop suey and other dishes invented or modified here that would spread across the country Dishes never eaten in China, such as beef and broccoli, others bearing little relation to the original, such as General Cho's chicken, created in Taiwan as a Hunan dish, tangy and spicy chicken pieces on the bone, but transformed here into something sticky, sweet, and boneless. Those Americanized dishes are now available at more than 50,000 Chinese American restaurants across the country. That's more than all the McDonald's, Burger Kings, Wendy's, and KFCs combined. And for good reason. It's delicious, not to mention usually inexpensive. Yet we probably all know someone who will look down his or her nose at a delicious dinner of sweet and sour pork, spare ribs, general chose chicken, and lo mein 
whining that it isn't authentic. It isn't what people really eat in China. Well, of course it isn't. It's an evolved cuisine of its own, Chinese American. Then again, what is authentic anyway? Just as food evolves here, it evolves everywhere. One of the most popular dishes in China today is scrambled eggs and tomatoes. Not what our whining diner is probably talking about. Oh, interestingly, Chinese food as served in China is becoming increasingly available in the US. There are now so many Chinese immigrants here, many of them grad students and professionals. The restaurateurs can actually make a living cooking for them, not for the typical American diner. As I tasted firsthand when I was taken by two young Chinese students to a massive Chinese food hall in Flushing, Queens, a part of New York that is now home to thousands of Chinese immigrants. There I found some dishes that were familiar enough, like noodles and dumplings, and many that were not, like dry pot. Originally a regional Chinese dish, in the 70s it began gaining popularity elsewhere in the country. It's a highly spicy stir-fried combination, at this food hall at least, made of whatever I chose from a wide assortment of options and priced by weight. I went with beef, fish, tofu skin, crab, seaweed, tripe, and kidney. I said no thanks to the artery. Now, one stall over, a man was hand pulling fresh noodles to serve in soup. We ordered two bowls, one with lamb, the other with beef tendon. A few stands down the line, we ordered duck soup. And nearby, we watched a woman expertly ladling crepe dough onto a hot circular cooking surface, just as they do in France. Unlike in France, though, two of the finished crepes were layered with fillings in between, then folded and tucked, almost like a rectangular burrito. We ordered a couple, and there were so many other items we didn't have room for. Fish balls, sausages, steam buns, potato noodles, dumplings, and one I really, really wish I'd ordered, sliced fish and hot chili oil. And there was much more than that. Everything cooked fresh right in front of you. And what I ordered was delicious. The beef tendon in my noodle and soup bowl had a deep, rich taste, chewy, but with a jelly-like texture. In the dry pot, kidney, something I had managed to avoid for, at the time, 64 years, was surprisingly good, reminiscent of liver, but a little softer. The duck soup was wonderfully rich, the gizzard in it a bit tough for my taste, but the slice of congealed duck blood served on the side, while unfortunately honestly named, had a uniquely bright flavor and a texture similar to liverwurst. The pancakes, savory and spicy, combined two textures. The outer dough was soft, but a crunchy piece of fried dough was hidden inside. There are some restaurants attempting to serve such dishes to Americans now, though as a culture, we are pretty well known for an aversion to organ meat and other body parts. My wife, daughter, and I were in Hong Kong a few years ago and had sought out a local non-touristy restaurant. Likely the only non-Chinese in the place, we found a seat at a communal table and started flagging down the servers who were circulating with woven baskets of dim sum. And we were having a fabulous meal until one waitress came over, opened the top of her basket, and before I could say anything, an elderly man sitting one table over, who hadn't said a word till then, piped up telling me, quote, that not for you. So, of course, I had to try it. It was duck foot, chewy, not a lot of flavor, but it was certainly authentic. Closer to its origins, but still clearly Americanized, is pizza. That all-American favorite began as a staple of the poorest of the poor in Naples. When a flood of Southern Italian immigrants came to America in the 1800s, 
pizza came with them, but not exactly the pizza they made back home. It became Americanized right off the bat because it had to. Pizza ovens in Naples burned wood. Baker's ovens in New York were larger and burned coal. That required a longer bake time. And the wheat here had a higher protein content than the wheat that grew around Naples. Combined, those factors resulted in a pizza with a crisper, less chewy crust than the pizza in Italy. And soon what had been the simplest food of the poor, dough and tomato, maybe topped with a piece of lard if it was a good week, began to evolve further. More toppings and variations. As pizza slowly trickled out from New York and a handful of other cities with significant Italian populations to the rest of the country. In the 50s and 60s, with Dean Martin singing, When the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, the trickle became a flood. On the one hand, the growth of national chains played a big part, bringing a uniform style of generic pizza everywhere. But at the same time, local pizza, pizzerias were creating regional styles. Today, there are as many as 30 of them. There's St. Louis pizza, thin and crisp, and topped with Provel cheese, a processed combination of Swiss, provolone, cheddar, and liquid smoke. New Haven style, baked in a coal oven, crunchy, chewy, often topped with clams. A trio from Chicago, deep dish, stuffed in thin crust. And there's Ohio Valley style, Quad City style, Rhode Island grilled pizza, grandma pizza, Philadelphia tomato pie, not to be confused with Trenton tomato pie, New England Greek style, Buffalo style with cup and char pepperoni that crisps and curls up around a tantalizing puddle of grease as it cooks. And there's one regional style that is having its moment right now, rocketing to national popularity in the last few years after six decades of anonymity, Detroit style. It's a rectangular pan pizza, perhaps most notable for a rim of caramelized cheese all around the edges. Created in 1946 by a Detroit, Detroit bar owner who baked them in heavy blue steel industrial pans that had been liberated from an auto supply shop or auto plant. Once unknown outside of Michigan, Detroit style is the latest pizza to be, quote, discovered. It's riding such a wave of popularity, you can even get it now at Pizza Hut. Perhaps more unlikely to have become a part of American cuisine, but clearly it has, is sushi. A top executive at the largest producer of prepackaged sushi in America told me when she was younger and went to grab lunch with her friends, it would be hamburgers and fries. For her kids today, it's sushi. And that's a perfect example of how I'm defining American cuisine. The foods that are our daily go-tos all across the country. And sushi is now everywhere. Convenience stores, supermarkets, college campuses, hospitals, baseball stadiums. At the same time, it's featured at some of the country's most upscale restaurants. At Masa in New York, a sushi dinner for one is $650, and that's before drinks. The Americanization of sushi began after the Second World War when a rebuilding Japan began sending business executives to Los Angeles. The first sushi bar there opened in 1964 and others soon followed all serving a Japanese clientele. But then something remarkable happened. Sushi became hip, trendy, discovered by movie and TV stars, musicians, the beautiful people, the style setters. In 1980, the popular NBC miniseries Shogun kicked off a huge wave of interest in all things Japanese. Shogun star Richard Chamberlain, in fact, recently told an interviewer, we put sushi on the map. Didn't hurt that a Senate report on national health released in 1977 recommended Americans all eat more fish. Now, 
sushi doesn't have to include fish. It's really about vinegared rice, but most Americans thought it did. So for those who were put off by raw fish, there was the California roll, which did away with the fish entirely using imitation crab and avocado. And as America's gateway drug to sushi, it opened the door to dozens of different varieties of Americanized sushi rolls, bigger with more ingredients and sauces than were ever used in Japan, like a dynamite roll with yellowtail, shrimp tempura, vegetables, rice on the outside to hide the seaweed topped with spiced tea mayonnaise, or the Philadelphia roll with smoked salmon, asparagus, avocado, and an item that has never been part of the Japanese diet, good old cream cheese. When sisters Lisa Randall and Carrie Leary wanted to boost sales at their Butte, Montana steakhouse, they very successfully added a sushi night with a menu that includes a roll filled with a pork chop. In the Oklahoma City suburb of Dell City, I even found a sushi chef making fresh rolls inside a gas station to accommodate local tastes in a place that prizes chicken fried steak. Most of the rolls are dropped whole into the deep fryer. Demand for sushi these days is so high that a company that franchises sushi chefs to supermarkets was recently sold to a Japanese company for more than $250 million. And other companies that supply pre-made sushi to retailers have turned to highly automated production lines called sushi robots to spit out thousands of pieces every day. In fact, it wasn't just bagels and sushi. Advances in technology have played a huge role in creating much of American cuisine. Italian immigrant Frank Mastro started a business reselling used restaurant equipment. Among his purchases, a coal-fired bakery oven piqued his interest. He began tinkering with it, put in a gas line, and invented the gas-fired pizza oven. It took up less space than a coal oven, required far less attention from the baker, heated up much more quickly, and had enough interior space to bake multiple pizzas at once. Convinced the pizza could be a very big thing in America, he promoted his new oven heavily, offering buyers financing, instructions on setting up and running a pizzeria, and on making the perfect pie. Between 1938 and 1953, he sold more than 3,000 pizza ovens, playing a huge role in spreading pizza all across America. It was another businessman who created our entire fast food industry in the first place by figuring out how to make hamburgers quickly and uniformly. And no, it wasn't Ray Kroc of McDonald's. It was a former real estate and insurance salesman named Billy Ingram, who created the White Castle chain in the 20s. Hamburger had come to the US in the 1800s with German immigrants, but in 1906, it became terrifying. After Upton Sinclair's fact-based novel, The Jungle, exposed the shocking dangers to consumers of grievously unsanitary packing houses that routinely sold contaminated, adulterated, old, rotting, and otherwise inedible meat. White Castle would attack that fear head on, building a chain of restaurants designed to create a hospital-like sense of cleanliness and safety by featuring only stainless steel and white porcelain. And it was White Castle that invented the assembly line method of preparing food quickly and uniformly, even making their burgers square to fit more of them on the grill at once. Now, what White Castle started, McDonald's perfected, even today using a clamshell grill that cooks their burgers not just on the bottom, but on the top as well to save time. It was a simple technological advance, a contraption to hold tortillas that could be dropped into a deep fryer to create crispy taco shells 
that led to the spread of Mexican food from California and the Southwest to the rest of the country. A restaurateur named Juvencio Maldonado patented what he called a form for frying tortillas to make fried tacos in 1947. Glenn Bell, the man who created Taco Bell in 1962, claimed he invented a similar device on his own. In any case, the ability to quickly create taco shells made it possible for Bell to turn Mexican food into fast food. Believe it or not, it was Taco Bell's expansion throughout the country that first introduced most Americans to some form of Mexican food. And that paved the way for actual Mexican-American restaurants to open in their wake, spreading a limited menu of Mexican-American dishes, a unique cuisine that evolved after the Mexican-American War ended in 1848, and America seized nearly half of Mexico's territory. Suddenly, hundreds of thousands of Mexicans finding themselves living in America. One of many Mexican regional cuisines, their northern Mexican cuisine, reduced in spiciness to suit Anglo tastes, and with replacements for Mexican ingredients not available here, would form the basis of Mexican-American food from that point forward. It would combine versions of traditional dishes with others created on this side of the border, Tex-Mex combination plates, heavy on cheese and sour cream, fajitas on a sizzling platter, huge mission burritos created in San Francisco. Some combination of those and other similar dishes became the tent poles of a familiar Mexican-American menu, which enraged an English woman named Diana Kennedy, who had moved to Mexico with her husband, the New York Times bureau chief there. She wrote a groundbreaking cookbook called, appropriately enough, The Cuisines of Mexico, published in 1972. It was a terrific piece of work, for the first time introducing Americans to the multiple regional cuisines in Mexico. But she did not stop with extolling that food. She went on to excoriate Mexican-American food as a terrible bastardization of the real thing. Dishes that, quote, have been brought down to their lowest common denominator on a par with the chop suey and chow mein of Chinese restaurants 20 years ago. Well, I think that was unfair that Mexican-American food is a wonderful cuisine of its own, as is Chinese-American. Kennedy opened America up to a whole new universe of Mexican food and inspired many chefs like the now famous Rick Bayless, to cook and promote Mexican food as made in the various regions of that country. But that launched a whole new debate about appropriation. Critics accused Bayless, not completely fairly, of casting himself, an Anglo, as the ultimate source, the guy who knew the truth of Mexican food, when that role should have been left to Mexican-American chefs. It's an argument you'll hear in food circles about a wide range of foods. Celebrity chef Andrew Zimmern got eviscerated, rightly in my opinion, when he opened up a Chinese restaurant in Minneapolis and announced that he was saving Midwesterners from, and pardon me, this is a quote, horseshit Chinese restaurants. Now, personally, I don't have a problem with a white American chef cooking the food of a specific ethnicity but not if he or she claims to be the ultimate interpreter of it, only if proper credit is given to where the food comes from in the first place, and only if the chef acknowledges, as Rick Bayless did, learning from the work of chefs native to the cuisine. In fact, the invisibility of those responsible for a food's creation or development is, in my view, a huge problem. Take a look at barbecue which is almost entirely the creation of African-Americans. It was slaves in the South who created the original recipes, combining Caribbean, Native American, and African techniques and flavorings 
to slowly cook an entire animal over hot coals. Over the decades, barbecue would spread throughout the country, carried north and west in many cases, as six million African-Americans fled the South during the Great Migration between 1916 and 1970. As barbecue became hip in recent years, self-professed foodies began debating the relative talents of pitmasters, almost entirely white men, they were discussing, who were suddenly media stars. A mostly white competition circuit, an expensive hobby, is one of the places barbecue writers find their next stars. Another is new oat barbecue restaurants, usually opened by young white men with financing that is harder for many African-American pitmasters to get. Now, there are exceptions such as Rodney Scott, who has gotten significant media coverage for his whole hog barbecue, first opening a restaurant in Charleston, then adding locations in Birmingham and Atlanta. In 2018, he won the James Beard Award for Best Chef Southeast. At least with more people talking about the situation, maybe it will improve in the future. As for barbecue itself, well, we're in the midst of a renaissance. So what is the future of barbecue? In fact, what is the future of American cuisine? On the barbecue front, we're in the midst of two major changes. An upscaling of barbecue, pitmasters using prime beef, experimenting with new sauces, flavors, and cuts. And we're seeing the regional walls of barbecue breaking down. Not that long ago, to get Memphis ribs, you had to go to Memphis. For Central Texas brisket, you had to go to Central Texas. Increasingly, though, you can find almost any style almost anywhere. Is that a good thing? Well, it can be if it's done right. Though I'm an old sentimentalist, and I look forward to eating a regional dish in the place it was born. But as I said, all cuisines evolve. And American cuisine is evolving in countless ways. A growing number of American sushi chefs are now prioritizing the sustainability of the fish they serve. African-American female Jewish sushi chef Marissa Baguette in Memphis is making sushi rolls with Southern plant ingredients, such as okra and collard greens. The artisanal bagel is enjoying a huge resurgence, with bakers all across the country once again making bagels the old-fashioned way by hand. In Denver, Rosenberg's Bagels and Delicatessen even treats the water they're boiled in to mimic the mineral content of water from New York City. Though, as a mostly lifelong New Yorker, I'm not convinced that New York's water really makes that much of a difference. There's a major artisanal pizza movement underway as well, a focus on better ingredients, wood-fired on uh, ovens, everything done by hand. At the same time that technology, from ordering apps to high-tech quick-cook ovens, are allowing fast, casual pizza chains to adopt the Chipotle model. Walk down the line, choose your ingredients, and get your pizza with fast food speed. And pizza now reflects health and nutrition trends, with cauliflower crust, gluten-free pizza, even keto pizza. And there's something now called Chinese 2.0, a new generation of highly trained chefs evolving Chinese food in America, pushing boundaries, attempting to elevate it to the same status as French or Japanese cuisine. My wife and I were treated to an amazing tasting menu dinner at Eight Tables Restaurant in San Francisco, 10 courses of incredible food such as caviar on duck skin with suckling pig and Spanish Iberico ham, poached lobster in a sizzling rice soup, and many more extravagant creations I'd never seen in any Chinese restaurant before. This is not the food anyone grew up with in China, the dishes some would call authentic. Chef and owner George Chen says what he is doing is channeling the essence of a great cuisine. 
asking what food is not interpretive? What cuisine is not interpretive? The cost of the dinner, by the way, was $1,000. We luckily were guests of the chef. In fact, every element of American cuisine is wonderfully in flux today. And as Americans, especially Gen Z and millennials are increasingly open to broadening their collective palates, I look forward to our great American cuisine continuing to evolve, perhaps adding dishes from more countries. Though it is interesting to consider that the number one retailer of bagels in America is, and has been for years, Dunkin' Donuts. Thank you very much for listening. Um, we have some technical issues that involve Q&A, so I'm now going to have to place a phone call to allow me to hear the questions. There we go. David, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us. Let me, let me call you. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, just, just indulge us for one moment. I hardly know the and guy. <laughs> there we go. How's so that, Danny? Hi, how are you? So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we do have a couple of minutes for, for questions. If you have a question, please type it in the chat. And uh, while they're thinking of that, uh, David, I do have a quick question for you. Is there anything, um, any regional cuisine in the United States that has not broken out nationally? that perhaps we should be on the lookout for? Regional cuisine? Um, no. Uh, I mean, yes, there's all sorts of foods that, that I don't expect to, to break out. I mean, especially uh, in the South, um, a variety of stews and such, uh, Brunswick stew or um, a particular low country stew in, uh, in Charleston. I think uh, there are some cuisines from other countries that um, are on the verge of breaking out. Um, and that includes different regional cuisines in Mexico. There is a, a phenomenal Mexican dish, a kind of stew called birria that um, has been increasing in popularity around the country. It's uh, originally from central Mexico, originally made with goat. The version that has become quite popular in the US is birria de reis, which is made with beef. Um, and you take uh, tortillas, you, you dip them in the cooking liquid that the, the meat was in, you put the taco on the grill, you fill it with meat, a little more of the sauce, cheese if the customer wants, you close the, the taco, you, you make uh, close the tortilla, make a taco, flip it over, make it crunchy, and it's to die for. I drive 90 minutes from my home to South Philadelphia for that. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, we certainly will. Um, I don't see any other questions in the chat, but uh, I uh, might as well ask you one more before we, before we leave for the evening because, um, because of your expertise and what's happening with food in the United States. I'm, I'm curious if you have any thoughts or comments on the growing indigenous food movement, and how you think that's going to affect uh, national cuisine. What do you mean by that? So there's um, a growing number of, uh, of American Indian um, chefs and uh, food co-ops that have been opening up. Uh, for instance, Sean Sherman in Minneapolis has opened a, uh, a I got restaurant you. that's yeah. strictly uh, pre, pre-colonial foods. Yeah, um, well, first of all, it's growing. Secondly, it's about time because indigenous cuisine is far more than fry bread. Um, the issue, the question in my mind is, is it just um, a momentary trend among foodies or those who consider themselves socially enlightened? Or is it here to stay? Now, I'll give it a few years. I don't see massive growth that says America um, is embracing this, even to the extent that America has embraced um, uh, another niche cuisine, which is plant-based eating. Um, we, we have never as a country expressed a whole lot of interest in the indigenous people's history here. So at the risk of being a downer, 
um, it'll be here. It'll be here for a while. But uh, if I were looking into a, um, a looking glass to the future, unfortunately, I don't think it will become a significant um, part of our cuisine. I just called you again when I answer your phone. Hi, can you hear me? So uh, we do. We do have one last question before we leave that somebody put in the chat. Um, so a lot of people are, are thanking you for a very interesting program and enlightening program, and you have my thanks as well. But um, a question. Oh, uh, somebody from Montreal says they have the best bagels. So I'm, I'm not sure if we're going to start something with any New Yorkers in the audience. But uh, also, um, the question is, do you have any plans to start any more uh, food based TV shows? Uh, at the moment, I'm concentrating on writing. Uh, I have another book in the works called Eating While Standing about mobile food. Um, as for Montreal bagels, that's like me saying that I really like banana cream pie and someone else saying, no, no, we have apple pie and it's better. Montreal bagels and New York bagels are a different food item. Montreal bagels are terrific but they're not New York bagels. Um, and you know they're terrific enough that they're being sold quite successfully in New York, but um, it's apples and oranges. Understood, understood, David. Well, um, this has been uh, really incredible and I, I've learned a lot and I hope everybody else has too. I, I really wanna thank you. Can you hear me? I really wanna thank you for, uh, 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 can you hear me now? Apologies. Apologies for the technical difficulties, everybody. But uh, David, I really want to thank you for a very interesting evening, and I certainly learned a lot. Thank you, everybody. We have multiple communities here tonight, uh, David, from three different uh, Jewish community centers, from the David Posnack Jewish Community Center in the Fort Lauderdale area, and the Alper JCC, which is uh, South Miami, and uh, my community, the Miami Beach uh, Jewish Community Center as well. So we thank you. And I want to thank you for inviting me and everyone um, who listened to me um, wander about my, my, my food life. Thank you. Okay. Much continued success. I hope uh, I, I see that you're a finalist for several book awards or won some book awards. So uh, continued success with this work. Thank, thank you, you very much. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us.